Good evening. The headlines tonight, the 6th of June, 1944. The liberation of Europe has begun. At dawn today, the greatest invasion force ever assembled started landing on the north coast of France. By sea and by air, huge numbers of British, American and Canadian troops were put ashore in Normandy. Tonight, Allied forces are several miles inland and there is fighting on the outskirts of Caen. Mr Churchill told the Commons this evening that all is going well. He said the operation had been carried out with much less loss than we expected. And in a broadcast tonight from Buckingham Palace, the King has called the nation to prayer. The Lord will give strength unto his people. And the Lord will give his people the blessing of peace. D-Day has come. The greatest military operation in history was launched this morning. Four years after the retreat from Dunkirk, our forces have returned to the beaches of France to rid Europe of tyranny. British, American and Canadian troops, backed by 4,000 aircraft, have landed along the coast of Normandy. The assault had apparently been delayed 24 hours because of bad weather. First news that the landings had begun was given by the BBC at 9.32 this morning. This is London. London calling in the home, overseas and European services of the BBC and through United Nations Radio Mediterranean. And this is John Snag speaking. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, have just issued communique number one. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. It's now known that the timing of the invasion was agreed more than six months ago. The operation began last night with bombing raids. They were accompanied by airborne landings. A few hours later, thousands of troops were put ashore on the beaches of Normandy. Tonight, Allied forces have reached the outskirts of Caen, but little is so far known about the progress of the American landing forces. The Prime Minister, Mr Churchill, has made two statements to the House of Commons. At midday, he said there were hopes that tactical surprise had been attained. At nine o'clock tonight, he said, this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. The House cheered. The channel at dawn was thick with ships, an armada carrying the invaders to France. 4,000 vessels with a host of smaller craft to attend them, Nelson would have approved. It was Dunkirk in reverse, a naval assemblage without precedent. A relentless bombardment of German shore defences prepared the way for the landings, a nightmare of Allied naval guns volleying and thundering, shelling that continued through the day. Time to go. After a quick breakfast, it was over the side and into a landing craft for thousands upon thousands of men. Each British soldier kitted out like a pack horse with ammunition and supplies. For these men, the trail had already been blazed. Sappers and special units had been ashore for hours clearing mines and booby traps, usually under fire. Flotillas of landing craft shuttled to and fro from the transports, putting men ashore. Months of planning come to fruition on what Normans call the Mother of Pearl Coast. The British and Canadian assault area, cheek by jowl with the American, spanned 24 miles of Normandy coastline. Almost 25,000 soldiers were landed today in one British sector alone. That is a measure of the size of this invasion. German shore defences went up in smoke as they were overwhelmed. The famed Atlantic Wall was not, after all, impenetrable. Tonight, the build-up continued. Not only men, of course, but tanks by the hundred, vehicles by the thousand, and mountains of stores. The fighting by evening was mostly inland, with Caen and Bayeux clearly at the main strategic targets. As the din of battle faded on the beaches, it was a moment for reflection by the Allied naval chief, Admiral Ramsey. 
we have broken the crust and caught the enemy napping. It seemed a fair conclusion. Veterans of Dunkirk rejoice. BBC correspondents are with every arm of the liberating forces. Soon after the assault began, their reports started to reach London. The BBC's Colin Wills was on board one of the landing craft. This is the day and this is the hour. The sky is lightning, lightning over the coast of Europe as we go in. But along the shore, there's a dense smoke screen as the battleships and the warships, the smaller warships, sweep along there firing all the time against the shore and some of them laying a smoke screen for us. The whole sky is bright, the sea is a glittering mass of silver with all these craft of every kind moving across it and the great battleships in the background blazing away at the shore. Before the troops went ashore, there'd been a huge aerial bombardment by more than 2,000 British and American aircraft. And stretching across 200 miles of sky went another 1,000 aircraft and gliders carrying troops. Mr Churchill said the airborne landings were on a far larger scale than anything that has ever been seen. We have two reports. As the invasion fleet set sail, Supreme Allied Commander General Eisenhower told his troops, don't worry about the planes overhead, they'll be ours. And they were. Wave after wave of aircraft wearing their new D-Day zebra stripes could be seen passing over the fleet. They provided the most gigantic air umbrella ever seen. Between midnight and 8 a.m., more than 31,000 British, American and other Allied airmen were over France. They remained virtually unopposed by the German Luftwaffe. During the day, 1,300 heavy bombers from the US 8th and 9th Air Forces and hundreds more medium and fighter bombers delivered their deadly loads in support of the landings. They'd been preceded by the British Bomber Command's heavies, unloading more than 5,000 tonnes of bombs, the biggest single night raid of the war to date. The Allies' flying artillery, RAF Typhoons and American Thunderbolt ground attack fighters, were out in swarms, marauding and strafing their way deep into France blitzing German troop trains, smashing depots, and disrupting communications. Many Luftwaffe planes were caught on the ground and destroyed. It was an historic mission these men prepared for last night, camouflaging themselves and their kit. They were to be the largest airborne invasion force ever, more than 20,000 men a force launched just seven seconds after midnight. The vanguard was a fleet of over 800 gliders, towed by transport planes and bombers in the dead of night, and released at 5,000 feet to silently swoop towards their designated landing zones. The first six gliders carried Allied troops who seized the Caen Canal and Orne River bridges within five minutes of landing. But there were inevitably tragedies, as gliders landed in darkness, trying to avoid the stakes, nicknamed Rommel's asparagus, driven into the ground to foil them. Behind the gliders, the second wave, a thousand planes which carried the paratroopers of the British 6th and the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. The faces of the men aboard betrayed their apprehension, but when it was time to go, there was no hesitation. The air was thick with parachutes unfolding. The airborne armada stretched across 200 miles of sky. Their mission was to disrupt German defences along the beachhead at Normandy to provide support for Allied troops landing from the sea. Reports so far indicate soldiers were landed with great precision. Despite losses, their achievement has been to bring confusion and uncertainty to the German forces on the Cherbourg Peninsula. This afternoon, the King and the Prime Minister visited Schaaf, the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, where they met the Supreme Commander, General Dwight Eisenhower. And tonight, from Buckingham Palace, His Majesty has broadcast to Britain and to the United States. Once more, he said, a supreme test had to be faced, and he called the nation to prayer. At this historic moment, surely, not one of us is too busy, too young, or too old to play a part in a nationwide, a worldwide vigil of prayer as the great crusade sets forth. And the Lord will give strength unto his people, and the Lord will give 
his people are the blessing of peace. News of the invasion was first picked up on German radio at six o'clock this morning. Since the first official news of the landing was given just after half past nine this morning, people have been waiting for details in a state of mounting excitement. Newspapers have been snapped up as soon as they've gone on sale. The Prime Minister has said it is much the greatest thing we have ever attempted. A report now on the secret preparations for D-Day. By last week, 13,000 aircraft, including bombers, fighters, transport planes and gliders, have been assembled. And in concealed locations in the south of England, tens of thousands of tanks, vehicles and artillery pieces were ready for embarkation. As all kinds of equipment could be seen rumbling through tiny village streets, a major problem was to make sure that everyone involved in the operation knew what to do and where to do it without breaching security. The channel is now more or less sealed at its western and eastern ends by destroyers, frigates and smaller vessels. At secret ports along the coast, more than 7,000 warships and merchant ships had for weeks been on standby. Eventually, an estimated 500,000 troops will be needed in France. As the first units went aboard, few of the men knew exactly where they were going. Some remained at sea for more than 24 hours before they received their final landing orders experiencing terrible seasickness in some of the worst June weather in the Channel during the last 40 years. All hospitals in southern England have been put on standby for the inevitable casualties expected during this biggest invasion ever mounted. In Berlin, the Germans have referred to what they call the long-expected Allied attack. Hitler's generals are predicting that the invasion will be a fiasco. In the United States, the mood is solemn. When the landings were announced, people at work stopped for prayer. And for the first time since the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, all the lights on the Statue of Liberty have been illuminated. On American radio, President Roosevelt has asked listeners to join him in a prayer that he wrote himself last night for the success of the invasion and for the men who are crossing the channel. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sisters, and brothers of brave men overseas, whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, Help us, almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. No reports have as yet been received about the American landings. The weather tonight in the Channel is unsettled. There is a strong northwesterly wind, heavy cloud and rain with little sign of moderation. So tonight, British forces joined by American and Canadian troops are back in France. In his broadcast this morning, the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight Eisenhower, said the landings were but the opening phase of the campaign. Great battles, he said, lay ahead. And last night, before the Armada set sail, General Montgomery told his men, to us is given the honour of striking a blow for freedom which will live in history. And that was the news tonight, the 6th of June, 1944, D-Day. From the BBC in London, good night.